All right. Hello, everyone. Jeffrey Gardner here. Welcome to another fantastical episode of The Lost Bots, a series dedicated to all the unsung heroes, cyber first responders, and secret squirrels out there. Today, we've got Mr. Stephen Davis, technical lead slash customer advisor on the line for an Imperial holding cell. So if there's any connection issues, you can blame the Death Star. Uh, for a segment called Stories from the Sock, where we share war stories about incidents the team's been involved in, the who, the what, the how it was discovered, all that fun stuff. But before we start talking about that subject, Stephen, can you tell our audience who you are and just what the heck a customer advisor is? Yep, absolutely, Jeff. So Stephen Davis, I am a customer advisor technical lead for the MDR service here at Rapid7. Um, high level, what a customer advisor is, is the security liaison between a customer and the Rapid7 SOC, providing uh, the MDR service as a whole. So a uh, customer advisor wears many hats, but our job is essentially to be the go-between in between a customer and the Rapid7 SOC to alert on any malicious activity in their environment, um, assist the customer in getting their IDR platform up and running, event sources plugged in, all the technical details, um, and also to help that customer improve their security posture uh, by making recommendations based off of, you know, the security applications in use and what is available to that customer um, on their end. So, it, again, it's a it's a hat, the many hat job or a job of many hats, rather, excuse mad me. Mad Hatter. You're a little bit of a uh, mad yeah, hatter. Exactly. Yeah, we're a mad hatter. Uh, but essentially, we're the, the first point of contact um, for any customer that has purchased the MDR service. Awesome. So a pretty valuable role. So war story time. What do you got for us today? So um, I'd like to talk about a, an interesting one uh, about an organization that uh, got pretty beat up by the use of embedded malicious macros, which is I, 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 I like it. Um, so tell us, tell us a little more about it. Why don't you go ahead? Not a problem. So Embedded macros um, with Excel docs and other Microsoft Office products, you know, highly used across many, many different organizations. And it's one of those kind of features that it's, it's very beneficial uh, for, for why they're in use and how they're in use. But at the same time, uh, if they can be used for good, they can most certainly be used for evil. So as, as however long an organization has been used to using macros in their environment, it can be exceedingly difficult uh, in order to stop using them uh, should the need arise. So there was a particular organization who fell victim to some phishing. And this particular phishing was a, a malicious Excel document with embedded macros. Um, interestingly enough, the embedded macro code was actually a lightweight script designed to actually validate compromised assets before it actually deployed the official malware. Well, that's so, like Mr. Deeds level, very, very sneaky. Um, yeah. yeah I mean, they're, they're trying to not get caught, which I don't know. I mean, based on your experience, you know, is, is that, is that a common thing? Cause from my days, it was like smash and grab like bank jobs. Like we're going to go in pillage and then get out. This seems like they were at least trying to not like make that first level alarm trip. It, exactly. And it, it's becoming more and more common from what I've been seeing. Um, but, you know, it is a lot harder to detect that type of stuff than the, your traditional malware that just kind of knocks down the front door and says, hey, I'm here. I've got your asset. Right. So uh, interestingly enough, that was the initial code that launched um, during the investigation of that particular code. Uh, it was identified as belonging to a particular type of malware called Griffin. Um, if you're not familiar with what Griffin is, it's a JavaScript backdoor that's mainly used for recon persistence and then also the deployment of additional malware. Um, and, and so that, um, as an aside to that, so Griffin, if memory is serving me correctly, and correct me if I'm wrong on this one, Griffin would be used or is traditionally used by a group called Fin7, correct? That's correct. So for those of you out there who may not be familiar with Fin7, um, you know, it's an APT that targets restaurant, retail, hospitality sectors. They're, uh, they're sometimes called the Carbonat Group because that's the type of backdoor they use for like data exfiltration and stuff. But uh, my favorite thing about the group, which I don't have many favorite things about APT groups, but uh, they use a type of malware called Pillow Mint, um, which I just, I love the name of it. Targets POS systems and is designed to like capture, capture credit card, financial information, all of that. 
Um, if you want to learn more about it, um, you can go to attack.mitre.org and search for the group uh, G as in golf 0046. So sorry for interrupting, but back to you. Oh, no worries, man. So traditionally, like you, like you stated, they go after the Fin7 organization goes after financial data, point of sale systems, trying to steal credit card information, things like that. Um, during this organization's investigation, uh, it was noted that there was no information leading to any type of compromised credit card theft or financial data. So during this entire time frame, as it was going, we saw a shift from point of sale systems to attempting to get access to other compromised accounts for financial employees uh, of the organization itself. Um, which led to multiple additional machine compromises and additional phishing, all using embedded macros. So it's, it was one of those things that, you know, they were able to shift gears. Uh, but the main point of this particular story is based off of office macros and how an organization can protect themselves, not just by blanketing and disabling things, because, you know, every organization is going to be a little bit different. Uh, not everybody can react the same way because you might close one door and, and part of your organization might not be able to work as effectively as before. Um, but this type of, of situation really brought to light uh, creating workflows on the organization side that should this happen, how would the team react in a positive way that wouldn't shut down part of, of you know, their workforce or at least hinder them and not be able to do their jobs because they have been used to using office macros for so long, right? So um, it's one of those that, yeah, you have to mitigate the risk. If you cannot have a business justification in order to turn something off like, a, like the flick of the switch, it's, it's good to have a plan of action for what you can do uh, kind of surrounding that type of, uh, type of situation. Yeah, because because part of the problem with that, and I'm, I'm sure we've all, you know, everyone out there has probably experienced this at some point or another is, you know, the separation of duties aspect of our jobs. So like people who are approving those rules aren't necessarily the ones that are going to be impl implementing that in the case of like macro attacks. Um, I think since the 2016 version of Office, Microsoft basically gave like two ways to mitigate this. One is you can download an administrative template and apply it via GPO to basically like block the uh, execution of macros from things downloaded from the internet. Or option B, there's a registry key you can set, which will like enable sandboxing of those malicious documents. But traditionally, those are out of our control. Like we can't just go onto a DC and apply a GPO all over the place. We have to go and talk to IT. We have to have change control. So it's like you said, having those processes built out in advance just allows things to go smoothly because sometimes you might not have an emergency change control procedure. And if you don't, if it's like a user facing change control, that usually requires like convening the whole change advisory board. And that takes, you know, a week or two and you're in the middle of an incident and it's like, we got to go, 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 but we can't. Yeah. So it's like, what it would, it's like, we're just kind of in that rut playing Russian roulette waiting for, you know, waiting for it to hit. Um, but yeah, back to you. Yeah, and that's going against you know your your change of approval board. That's that's great if an incident happens during business hours on a weekday uh, uh, when everybody's yeah. in the office. But what would happen if it was two in the morning on a weekend or a holiday? You know, it's that particular those individuals on that board might not be around. They might be on vacation. So it's it's really important. You know, we we stress user awareness training. You know, specifically for phishing, right? Um, but it's also important to stress kind of the same element but towards the security team for any organization, right? They, in grade school, you practice fire drills. Now the fire drill wasn't to stop a fire or prevent a fire from happening, but it was to almost essentially build muscle memory. Should that alarm go off, everybody knows what to do. So tabletop exercises comes to mind for security organizations or, or individuals who are working security for a particular organization. Um, should something happen, an incident happen, you might not have the power or the ability to, to essentially shut the fire door, but with good practice and enough drills with tabletop exercises and internal security training, um, you know, you would have a workflow that everybody knows their part and you would drastically shut down or, or you know, hinder any type of incident like this because everybody has their role. They know what to do in the event that the change can't be made um, or, you know, 
if it, if it can't be made, they know what to do. If it can be made, they know what to do on that route. So it's very, very important uh, in that aspect to, to really train your team, um, you know, talk to other individuals, uh, OSINT, whatever you need to do in order to find what works, what doesn't work. And then, you know, how does that work in your organization? Because every organization is a little bit different. So, yeah. And then, so I'm assuming this incident closed out, was remediated, everything is good. But in terms of the scope of it, like what's what's the role of a, of a CA play? Because I'm I'm just going to assume, um, you know, shutting any rapid seven knowledge I may have in my head off, going back to practitioner land. I'm going to assume that there's like an incident manager assigned. You know, when an incident response escalation is kicked off, are you, you know, where do you fit in that process? Are you still like the go between? Is it the incident manager? Like, what role did, did you play in this incident? So speaking of you know fire drills and, and workflows. Um, when an, they call it a remote incident response, an RIR. So when that is kicked off, the CA essentially stops becoming the primary go-between in between the SOC and the organization, right? Um, the SOC will stand up their own internal RIR team, which is comprised of, you know, a SOC manager or a SOC team lead with a bunch of, of high-end analysts. Um, and the CA's job is to essentially become a, uh, you know, just the go-between. We set up the meetings, the daily meetings that need to go on in order for the SOC team to talk to the, the organization security team and any other personnel on their end that needs to be involved in this situation. Um, also, the ensuring that communication is still open, uh, multiple updates throughout the day. If any requests uh, from the SOC need to be made to that organization for additional logs that are needed, anything like that, it's up to the CA to ensure that that information, you know, goes to the customer and if possible, that those logs and that data gets back to the SOC and just to ensure that everything runs smoothly. So um, it is really, really important. We, we take a step back because we are not analysts. So we're not going in there building out timelines or, or triaging anything, um, but we're just there to essentially help and to talk to the, the organization and, and bring some insight and, and help. Well, that, that timing of communication is important though. So like, for example, my last industry was, was healthcare and we have timelines where, you know, if an incident or a breach, breach is discovered, we have, you know, X amount of minutes or hours or days in order to report it. So that timely communication between, you know, the SOC to you, the organization, you know, in all aspects of our, I guess, minutes matter. So it's not just in the, in terms of the technical, it's also in terms of the reporting. So I exactly. think that, you know, kind of plays a, a key aspect of it, um, just rounding it out and making sure like, that lessons learned at the end as well. Like, you know, you meeting with the org going through, what did we find? What are those remediation steps that we need to take long-term so that this doesn't happen again? Obviously, I think in this instance, you know, tabletop exercises was probably uh, a recommendation made to the organization, but still, um, you know, uh, fantastic. So in total, um, you know, before we get to the end of the segment, how, how long did this incident run roughly? Just shy of 30 days. Good Lord. <laughs> yeah, it was uh, it was it was long. It was long. It was it was a tedious process. Now, the the in, entire compromise didn't consist of that. Um, but, you know, there's a lot more to it than, you know, stopping the bleeding and, and kicking the, the malicious actor out. Right. Then you have to do a lot of the timeline and you have to dig through countless amounts of logs and machine files in order to, to try and get that full scope so that the organization knows, OK, here are all the, here's how it happened. Here's when it happened. Here's potentially why this occurred. So, so building all that out takes quite a bit of time, patience, and effort. Paperwork. It's the least, oh, yeah. least favorite part of the job, man. Um, so, you know, we're, we're rounding up at the 15 minute mark. So to wrap things up, uh, the endpoint. So Steven, if you had, you know, to give the audience one technical takeaway from the incident, you know, improve the posture, something to look out for, what would that be? The takeaway that I would obviously recommend is regardless of the remediation recommendations that you might receive um, or might come up with practicing, you know, your worst case scenarios, right? User awareness training for your end users, because like I mentioned earlier, it started off with a phishing email, right? So train up your users to be suspicious about things and to just be cognizant of, of what they're receiving, right? Um, but also even almost as 
probably most importantly, you know, train the security staff for that organization, tabletop exercises. Even if a, a scenario might seem completely outlandish, prepare for it. You know, it's better to be prepared uh, than to, you know, to not be prepared to, to put it bluntly, actually. Well, I think, um, I think the thing that we can both relate to being ex-military is the, the hope for the best plan for the worst scenario. Exactly. Like yep. you plan, you know, you hope that you have your best days, but you plan for your worst. And that way, if the worst actually happens, it's a bad day, but it's not a horrible day. <laughs> yeah. And that, that really speaks to when you, when you do those tabletops and you do those, um, those practice sessions and that internal training and stuff like that, it would it will drastically cut down on all of that time where people are just scrambling around trying to figure out what's going on and you have four individuals or five individuals however many all targeting the same thing instead of knowing their specific roles having identified roles of who needs to do what so that when you do come together it's a lot more efficient and it's a lot more just did you get this done yes did you get that done yes this done no but i got up to this point why because of this okay so it, it's a that collaboration is going to be a lot more effective if everybody knows their role and is trained for it awesome and I'll, and I'll piggyback on that you know tabletops are one of the most important things i've done again hope for the best prepare for the worst but if you have the the resources available to you um you know standing up a little cyber range and turning at least like a demo or a lab environment so you can test out some of these changes you know even though it is an emergency change it'll just help give the business that much more confidence to be like, hey, I tested this in the lab. It didn't shut our systems down. It didn't break anything. We can proceed with this, you know, with minimal risk. There's always going to be some risk, obviously, but minimal risk. And that way, at least the business owners will be good signing off on something which could potentially, you know, have some adverse effects, but you've tested in the lab. You're all good. Um, so thank you, Stephen. And a very special thanks to all of you out there for tuning in. Um, you know, if you like this series, I'm going to drop a big word. You want to see it grow to Brobdingnagian proportions and look it up. It's my favorite word of the day. Uh, remember to share this out to your networks, tweet, gram, whatever the heck other cool verb people are using to means get the word out and we will see you next time. So hope you all have a great day.